because I was. What blew your mind about that? I was 19, and Julianne Moore is, you know, like, she's, she's kind of, you know. And, so, <laughs> and Woody Harrelson's fun as James Carville, who's, like, you know, having a breakdown now in the news constantly. So Carville is still Carville. Was it in that? Actually, yeah, yeah. I don't even know. Woody Harrelson plays James Carmel. No, Woody Harrelson plays the guy who works for John McCain. See, this Which movie one? had a farm. Did, yeah, I don't remember this movie, so like, honestly. So, <laughs> I've seen it one time. I, I've seen this movie. I've seen the movie that like sparked my political awakening one time, but I've seen, I've seen uh, John, I was like 2003 The Tuxedo starring Jackie Chan and Jennifer Lopez. Woo! Let me tell you. So, you're going to stay with us for the bad, but before you do that, can you talk about the discourse for a minute? That's your amazing podcast that everybody should... Woo! Yeah, I host the podcast called The Discourse, you know, shout out to myself for creating it. <laughs> uh, the, so, you know, I am the uh, you know, creative director, executive producer, uh, showrunner, unless you don't like it, then I have nothing to do with it. And it's, and it's actually all my, uh, my friends, Rich and Adair. <laughs> who have really, I don't know, like forced me to be a part, a part of this against like, my will. They name all the episodes themselves too. I don't, you know, all those names offensive, are good. All those offensive, offensive names are their ideas. I, I you're going to stick with us for the bad, and we're going to do a lightning round bad where we're all going to talk about it. But first, my friend in the sound booth, can you give us our bad uh, sound drop next, please? No? Oh, is this it? Sorry. But it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. I mean, not good. No good, really bad for you. But it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. Believe me, not good. <laughs> and today's bad is the Democratic National Committee, Democratic Party, and the Iowa Democratic Party. <laughs> Yes, Brandon, go ahead. I actually heard a secret. You want to hear a secret about Iowa? Oh, I guess I do. That makes news. Bernie won. He's going to win New Hampshire. I'm going to win and continue to do so. I, Iowa was so, was so... Oh, shit, it's my kid. I need to get into the holding room. <laughs> Iowa was so weird for me because you, you know me, Michael. We talk a lot, and whenever we talk, I talk about my love of conspiracy theories and my love of <laughs> yes. like I have an unapologetic love of anything conspiratorial, uh, specifically flat Earth podcasts. Like Globe of the Lie, uh, <laughs> classic broadcast. Globe the Lie, and so you know, once someone was telling, you know, once the the incidents multiple in Iowa went down, it, the, the big call was that let's not engage in conspiratorial thinking. And my thought was like. Absolutely, we should. I, mean, I love conspiracies. Tell me what you got. <laughs> you know, how can we like fold in Freemasons into this? How can we? How can we? You know, like how? I need you to explain to me how like water is actually fake. Like, what, like this, this globalist. <laughs> like I didn't know, but actually that's a serious point because how do we figure out? Like, look, if you have a complete conspiratorial view of the world, it's totally disempowering, you can't get anything done, so don't do that. And then on the other hand, to just be like, well, I don't know, I mean, it, it is incredible to me, though, that like, the same people who literally are like, did you read Jonathan Shade's piece about how in 1985 that, uh, you know, Donald Trump met Mikhail Gorbachev at a pizza hut in Moscow, and he's been a Russian intelligence asset ever since? Yeah, that, that's actually really interesting. We should book that for the A block. Wait a second. <laughs> a app totally fucked up, and in front of everybody, that's the thing, you don't even need to believe anything. Do you think for a second, if Pete Buttigieg won the state by 5,000 votes, that it would be anything other than called for him, called for him promptly, and that there wouldn't be a media love fest, which there already was with him losing for several years? <laughs> I mean, even, I don't know, how long have you been waiting for the Iowa folks to come in? I'm still not really sure, and this is disappointing for me personally as someone who loves conspiracy theories, I'm not even sure what the conspiracy theory actually was, was supposed to be at this point. Because from my perspective, we have a series, for Iowa, we had a series of very troubling facts that the people gave 
uh, campaign was, you know, in direct contact with the people who were, you know, that who were in charge of designing the software that was meant to tally votes. Why they needed to have software to tally votes and what could have been like, shit, we could have a caucus right here. You know, who wants to vote for Bernie? Yeah, but uh, no, no second alignment. We're up a bit of hundred. No second alignment. No second alignment is get out. Get the fuck out of here. There's no reason to leave. No, but so like people kept saying, let's not engage in conspiratorial thinking. Let's not let's not talk about this until all the facts are present. And I wasn't sure what facts they were talking about. I was like, well, the facts are that we have so far seem sufficient to say that something, if not. Uneth oh, well, no, if not illegal happened, something incredibly unethical happened. You know, we have a campaign direct contact. With, you know, we have what seems to be a no bid sweetheart deal for ex Clinton and Obama staffers. Uh, get, you know, to make an app that is fucking functions worse than Tinder. And <laughs> not for me, but you know, for, <laughs> for normal people. Um, and like those facts, from my perspective alone, are enough to like. This is, not, this is not okay. You know, whatever happened to the, you know, the appearance of impropriety? Whatever happened to judges recusing themselves from cases because they happen to have some connection to the, the, the defendant or the, pro, the prosecutor? Bernie Sanders said there was a polling error in a Des Moines Register poll. The media was like, oh, you're totally right. Let's pull it. I mean, I don't think losing one the poll error. One person. About the whole poll poll. One person said Pete wasn't mentioned when they asked me, and that entire poll, which is the most important poll, networks do specials about it. Bold. Bold. Yeah, I'm sure. And then if like, if like two thirds of them left Bernie out, they would have been like, why is well, Bernie always trying to be toxic? Sorry, yeah. And just one more point about that is like, how would help Buttigieg is when people go to the second round in their caucuses, if a poll came out showed Buttigieg in a bad third, people are going to be less persuaded to go over Absolutely. to his point. So it helped them that day. It, it's good. He's good at politics, Buttigieg. Yeah, he's good at CIA politics. Exactly, he's got, he's got a lady on his side. He's good at Babylon. I've actually heard an interesting, real conspiracy theory about Pete Buttigieg and his like, sort of weird CIA plot. <laughs> Get yeah, up that hill. I interviewed uh, Ken Klippenstein last night. Yeah. Of and uh, long-time friend for this course, Ken Klippenstein, or as I call him, Triple K. Um, <laughs> Happy Black History Month, everybody. <laughs> Tip your local, I mean me. I, I accept tips, 100%. That, that's, what, that's what the podcast game is, right? No. Uh, but anyway, no. Like, that he's not even a CIA agent or like a secret spook or some Manchurian candidate, but he's actively cultivating that kind of myth about himself. Yeah. Because it makes him more interesting than just like a senior associate at fucking McKinsey for like three years, who was like, you know, main claim to fame is like making sure that bagels cost like five dollars to put a tea. So that's exactly, like, no, he wasn't destabilizing foreign governments that want to build libraries for their kids. He was just making sure you pay another nickel for white bread. <laughs> he, yeah, he was getting, uh, exactly. he was getting uh, stock boys yelled at by grandmas in Canada for like, like this bread used to be 10 cents when my day, and now it's like, well, blame Pete, blame Mayor Pete. Yeah, Brandon, yeah, actually blame Mayor Pete for everything. Brandon, thank you so much as always. You're going to come back for the final segment, and please, many more times on TMBS, Brandon Sutton, check out the Discord. Brandon Sutton. <laughs> Folks, I'm very excited and very honored, of course, by all these guests. We have two more before we have our final game, and then there's a video that we're going to play briefly. Uh, we learn so much from this guest. He teaches us history, which I think is probably the most important thing that everybody's missing out on. And he does it with a plum and serious experience, which we all need to learn and, uh, learn from. Harvey J. K. is with us. Quiz. Are there any fucking anti-Semites out there? 
Any fucking racists out there? The reason I ask that is, we have to be prepared. They're coming for us, okay? They're coming for us and they're coming for Bernie. And our task is to know what to expect, okay? Harvey, this is what we're gonna talk about a bit in our in this segment. What kind of and, and people really need to know this. We're not gonna go ahead and talk about every aspect of the FDR legacy, obviously, the accomplishments and the failures and the complexity, but we are gonna talk about one very specific thing, which is that he was, and what I think we actually can all historically agree, was a mediating, a, a revolutionary, but a mediating, it wasn't a communist, it wasn't a Marxist, it wasn't an anti-capitalist agenda, as the people on the left love to point out. It still earned the fascistic interest of corporate America in running some of the most vicious campaigns imaginable. And this is gonna hit Bernie, it is gonna hit this movement, and Harvey, I'd like you to give us some examples from history. Okay, so the first thing to understand is that Roosevelt is far better than most historians portray him. He made <laughs> and he undeniably made some very terrible, tragic, brutal decisions affecting Japanese Americans, African Americans, and Jews. Understand that. But it's also the case that the Roosevelt administration represented a revolution. And I will tell you, just as, just as Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation as African slaves ran north to join the Union forces, and white soldiers realized what, what, what shit was going on in the South when they saw slavery firsthand, and, and signed that Emancipation Proclamation, we have to understand that Roosevelt empowered working people as they had never been empowered before in America. <laughs> When he, ran, when he ran for office in 1932, people don't realize this, in 1932, he actually said to a friend, we need to make America radical, fairly radical, for at least a generation. And then, and then he pursued a, 